Hello, my name is Todd. I'll be talking about joint work with uh, Tobias uh, Cape and Dexter Cozen from Cornell and my supervisor, Alexander Silva at UCL. Our paper is a fresh take on an uninterpreted imperative programming language introduced in 2019 by Dexter and Tobias and Alexandra and their collaborators. The language I wanna talk about uh, fits into a larger paradigm dealing with bits of code whose functions, variables, tests, whatever have been left uninterpreted. Uh, the motivation for doing this is basically that when we reason about programs, all of that extra structure might actually get in the way. Uh, it's best to not lose the forest and the trees, if you'll excuse the preemptive pun. Uh, there's already a large body of work in this area, starting, well, starting in a way with cleaning algebra. Uh, and here are some, some of the names that I've you know, come across looking into the history of it. Uh, but this is by no means a co comprehensive list, by the way. I, I just wanted to mention some of the relevant entries in the chronology, in particular the ones from the last two decades. So in order to really talk about the language that I, I want to talk about in a, in a second here, I actually kind of need to introduce cleaning algebra with tests first. It's, very, it's important context. So let's talk about cleaning algebra with tests. Uh, cleaning algebra with tests is an uninterpreted programming language um, that has made quite a huge impact on program schematology in general. Uh, it looks a lot like, you know, uh, classic cleaning algebra, except it extends the constants zero and one, which, you know, form kind of a, a Boolean algebra in cleaning algebra, uh, with an arbitrary Boolean algebra. <coughs> uh, so often they're taken to be finite Boolean algebras, and these are all of the form, you know, two to the A for some A. So uh, I'm just going to treat Boolean tests, um, you know, in this extension of cleaning algebra. Uh, as being sort of subsets of a fixed set A. So here, A is a set of atomic tests, which you can see as giving a full picture of a moment in time. Um, so maybe, the, you know, what's, what are in the stores in a machine or something like that at a particular time. Um, and, uh, you know, each Boolean test, so uh, in general, general Boolean test is just composed of the, all those atomic tests. So it is the set of atomic tests that uh, it satisfies. So Semantically, cat expressions denote uh, languages, kind of, you know, in, in uh, an analogy with uh, classic cleaning algebra. Uh, so uh, the semantics of cleaning algebra with tests uh, is, um, uh, uh, so they're called uh, regular languages of guarded strings. So every cat expression denotes a regular language of guarded strings. Uh, and you know this algebra of regular languages uh, on guarded strings was actually axiomatized in 1996. So there's a sound and complete axiomatization of uh, cleaning algebra with tests in terms of this uh, language equivalence. Unfortunately, though, CAT is quite expressive. You can write down lots of different programs in CAT. Uh, and so deciding equivalence actually ends up being uh, p-space complete in general. So it's a bit of a hassle to decide when two CAT programs are equivalent. The language we'll be talking about is a fragment of cat. So it's a really nice fragment of cat where deciding equivalence is actually quite a bit easier. So uh, GCAT, guarded cleaning algebra tests, is the fragment of cat that encodes while programs. It has constructs like if then else clauses guarded by Booleans like B and C in this picture and while loops uh, also with guards. Uh, and uh, you know each of the, the Booleans and, and the actions uh, are left uninterpreted in the uh, in the while program. Okay, so the real beauty in forgetting what precisely these actions and booleans you know mean specifically uh, is uh, well, it allows us to refactor our code. So uh, we can refactor our code with a level of confidence that really only a mathematician could. For example, this program that I've written down here, which looks a little bit convoluted, is actually equivalent to this one on the right, much simpler, and we can prove this this equivalence formally. Uh, and by really nice, I, I didn't just mean that while programs are intuitive and that we can you know, prove equivalences. Uh, I also mean that uh, decidability of equivalence in GCAT is a lot less of a hassle. So in the 2019 paper where GCAT was introduced, uh, you know, they, they show that uh, deciding equivalence of GCAT programs can be done in actually nearly linear time. So these two programs do the same thing and we can uh, make that, you know, we can test we can uh, you know, decide whether or not these two programs do the, the same thing in nearly linear time. Uh, okay, uh, so formally speaking, 
GCAT expressions are terms in the following algebraic signature, the uh, signature that's on the screen. Again, here A is a set of atomic tests, and the set sigma uh, contains the basic uninterpreted actions of the language. Uh, so here are the code interpretations of tests and actions. Uh, programs can also be combined using if then else clauses. So uh, if, if you're familiar with cat, you would write this if then else clause like this. Um, you can also uh, you know, run programs one after the other. So there's a sequential composition uh, and you can write while loops. So you can loop bits of code in a you know, kind of a star-like way. So we've replaced the, the cleaning star with a Boolean guard. Um, and again, if you're familiar with cat, you can actually write this program uh, as I've written on the right-hand side here. So really, GCAT is just a restriction of cat to the uh, guarded choice and star operations, uh, as the name indicates, I suppose. OK, so how do we run a GCAT program? What are actually, what do these programs mean? So GCAT, GCAT programs run deterministically and sequentially. Uh, they do so by reading a, a stream of atomic tests and reacting by either performing an action and, and moving on to you know, the next state, um, or by failing and entering deadlock. Uh, they can also su terminate successfully. So, uh, so sorry, I didn't, yeah, okay. They can, they, can, uh, they can perform an action, move on, they can fail uh, by entering deadlock, or they can terminate successfully. So uh, this picture I kind of um, illustrates the three possibilities. We can, uh, when you've, you've put an atomic test in, in the hopper, it'll, it might you know, uh, perform an action and uh, the sort of internal state of the machine will change, um, or we can enter deadlock, uh, or uh, you know, uh, uh, at the next action we can perform an action, uh, or maybe we can you know, terminate successfully. So this last one is like the ending of a calculation. We've, we've finished the, the, the purpose of the program is finished and, and uh, it's run its course. So um, to give you a, a formal example of one of these automata, uh, on the left here, I've written down a nested if then else statement and on the right, uh, it's automaton interpretation. So you can think of the automaton interpretation of uh, a GCAT expression as being sort of a line by line execution uh, of the program. So if we start here in the automaton, it's like starting at the, the, the first line of the program. If we feed this automaton uh, a, a, an atomic test in C, so some A and C, then we'll make this transition and we'll move on to this line uh, of the program. And then again, if we feed it uh, an atomic test in B, then we'll make this transition and we'll get ready for uh, uh, successful termination because no matter what we do after that, you know, uh, the program will successfully terminate. And of course, we've, we've, we've performed action P twice uh, in, in, on this automaton. It's important to note here that the whole set of expressions is actually itself an automaton. And the way that we get uh, the interpretation of a GCAT expression is we just sort of take a snapshot of a small bit of that, um, that larger automaton. Wow, I'm not doing a very good job at drawing a box around this. Anyways, this right here is like a, a small snippet of the much larger uh, automaton consisting of all expressions. Okay, so now, like I said, this, this automaton I've drawn here is very much a calculation. It runs in finite time and you know, doesn't always land in deadlock. So in 2019, in the 2019 paper, uh, GCAT programs actually denote calculations uh, in general. So they're calculations with, with uninterpreted steps. And what this meant for their interpretation is that the programs actually needed to end, you know, terminate successfully eventually uh, in order to be meaningful programs. This is very much the you know, um, programs or calculations uh, point of view. We're going to take a slightly different stance uh, you know, in, in the slides to come. I'm going to treat GCAT programs as processes instead. So unlike calculations, processes don't need to end at all to be meaningful. All that really matters about a process is that it has behavior. So it does stuff when you prompt it. In precise terms, though, um, you know, we, we can make the concept of behavior precise. So in precise terms, uh, behaviors are actually um, uh, sort of, I mean, they're trees. They take the form of trees. And we obtain them by unfurling an automaton from a particular state, uh, or maybe unrolling. I think that's also a term that's used. 
So for example, here I have a short little while loop that I've written. Unfurling this automaton from this state and uh, forgetting the specific lines of code that I, I, you know, that we encounter as we sort of run outwards from this, this state, uh, we obtain this tree. So this state, the automaton, corresponds to this node in the tree, and then as we run outwards, we obtain this, this you know, uh, we obtain this tree, kind of uh, constructing it one transition at a time. So we've forgotten the individual states and uh, or the labels on the states when we're, we've built this tree. So uh, here in this tree, uh, well, okay, this tree really only encodes the input-output behavior of the automaton, as you know, if we were to start from that state. It really only answers the question, what action happens next? And, and it does so without paying any attention to what specific state we are sitting on at any time. Uh, and indeed, uh, many different expressions in automata will actually unfurl into this very same tree and that is kind of the point. So um, a little bit more formally than that, uh, a behavior is a deterministic directed tree labeled in very much the same way as the automata from before. Uh, and we can collect them all together into a set. So I'm gonna call this set Z. So Z is the, the set of all of these trees, all these unfurlings of automata, all these you know, deterministic directed trees with the same kind of labeling, uh, flavor of labelings. So as you might expect, the set Z actually itself carries an automaton structure, and we uh, drew a very small portion of it right here. This is kind of a depiction of a very small portion of that automaton. And what I mean by this is a small portion is, okay, well, I've drawn this tree, um, but this is also a tree, right? Right here, this, the, the, the subtree kind of rooted here. And this transition right here is exactly a transition in Z. So the transition relation is just um, the sort of parent to child transition relation. Okay, but actually Z is a very special automaton. So, I mean, seeing it's an automaton at first is also, you know, like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But actually it's a very special automaton. It's the final automaton. So it is the final GCAT automaton. That's actually where it gets its name, Z, the final letter in the alphabet. Okay. So anyways, what it means for this to be the final uh, automaton is that um, if you're given any other automaton, V, there is a unique map, a unique automaton homomorphism, mapping the states of V to trees. And as you might expect, that this unique homomorphism is just the unfurling, uh, the unfurling map, the, the map that unfurls a state to get a tree. So applying this to the set of expressions, which is itself an automaton, we obtain precisely this uh, notion of equivalence that we care about, behavioral equivalence. So if E and F are expressions and they unfurl into the same tree, we call them behaviorally equivalent. And uh, I mean, this is exactly the sort of equivalence that we're, we're going to try to capture uh, with, with you know, an axiomatization. So what we're saying here is that all we really care about with expressions is uh, what input output behavior they have. So in other words, we're really thinking of the automata that correspond to the expressions as black box machines that just have atomic tests for buttons. So what behavioral equivalence is really about is just what the machine does from the, from the perspective of the user. That, that's the one way that you can see it. You know, what happens when I hit the buttons? Okay, so how is this notion of equivalence distinct from the language equivalence in the 2019 paper? So uh, language equivalence actually only takes into account those traces that end in successful termination, uh, and, you know, which are necessarily sort of, sort of finite. Uh, and to see what I mean, just observe that, uh, uh, that these three expressions, p and then zero, so do p and then fail, do p forever, p to the a, and fail, all accept the same, same language. All the, you know, n none of them uh, are, are meaningful calculations. None of them perform any meaningful calculations at all, right? Uh, none end in successful termination, no matter what buttons you push. So they all denote the same language, but uh, obviously we've drawn three different trees and so they're behaviorally distinct. Kind of remarkably, this distinction only affects the axiomatization from uh, the 2019 paper in a really subtle way. So here, um, 
is the axiomatization from 2019. Uh, if you take kind of a close look at it, you'll see that S3 is not sound in the behavioral uh, interpretation, uh, precisely because of this, these two uh, expressions right here. So these two, you know, the, the inequivalence of these two tell us that S3 is actually not sound. Okay, kind of remarkably, if we delete this axiom, we get a sound and complete axiomatization for GCAT up to behavioral equivalence. Okay, so I want to take some time to talk about how exactly this works. So specifically the soundness and completeness proofs uh, for behavioral equivalence, since that's where all the fun math happens. Um, and I'm also going to take a little bit of time to explain this axiom right here, what, uh, what's called the uniqueness axiom, or the UA, uh, which actually naturally leads us to a completeness proof for the behavioral interpretation. Okay, so the idea behind the soundness theorem is kind, kind of neat, actually. Uh, basically, we can interpret the GCAT operations in the set of behaviors itself. We can program in Z. Uh, and this, of course, turns the set of behaviors into an algebra with the same signature as the GCAT expressions. And here's sort of my pictorial depiction with party hats of uh, how, what these operations actually do. It's noteworthy, by the way, to uh, it's not really that this, the, the actual space of behaviors is quite large. Uh, it's uncountable. It's much larger than the set of GCAT expressions. And so, I mean, that uh, immediately uh, already tells us that not every behavior corresponds to an expression. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at which expressions, uh, which trees actually come from expressions in a second. So the set of expressions in the signature of GCAT is the well, okay, by definition, it's the initial algebra. Uh, and what that means is there's a unique algebra homomorphism into Z. Well, there's a unique algebra homomorphism into any algebra in the same signature. But in particular, there's this, this algebra homomorphism from the expressions into Z. Uh, and actually, we can show that this algebra homomorphism is an automaton homomorphism and is therefore also the unfurling uh, map uh, by uniqueness of the automaton homomorphisms into Z. So this is the real uh, first real observation that the proof of soundness makes. Now, soundness follows from this theorem. So that Z as an algebra actually satisfies the axioms of GCAT. OK, so we're not quite trying to axiomatize Z, though, as I said before. Really, we care about those expression, those trees that come from expressions. So call a behavior nested if it's of the form, you know, the unfurling of some expression. Uh, what the soundness theorem tells us is that the algebra of nested behaviors actually satisfies our axiomatization. And this is really the algebra we're trying to axiomatize. Okay, so um, uh, this is kind of analogous to the situation in Kleene algebra, just by the way. Uh, there are various axiom, you know, there are the various axiomatizations are trying to capture the algebra of regular languages. Um, our behaviors are actually certain kinds of languages in the sense of the connection is more formal than it sounds. Um, but really what we're trying to axiomatize is the algebra of nested behaviors. Uh, okay, anyways. So let's talk about the uniqueness axiom and what it means for the uniqueness axiom to be sound. Um, so it's a little difficult to explain, um, uh, but it's going to lead us right into the completeness proof. So it's, it's worth taking the time. Uh, here we have an equation in one variable. So I just want to consider this equation in one variable for a second. It essentially asks for a fixed point of the map that takes x right here to the program uh, if b then px else 1. So if b perform p and then return and then else and successfully. So as you could probably guess, there's exactly one behavior that satisfies this equation. It's the while loop, while b do p. OK, so the important feature of this equation that I've written down, OK, well, the important feature of the expression p is that it actually does something. So thinking about what it does on trees, for instance, it prefaces a tree with a whole layer of do p, right? So it'll take a tree, x, and it'll preface it with a bunch of transitions of this form, right? So if you think about um, you know, just standard metrics on trees, uh, you, you know, very like uh, Cantor set uh, type 
metrics on trees, um, if you're familiar with those, this as a map, uh, you know, the, the, the map which takes a tree to this, you know, P, if, if B, then P, and then, and then tree else, else one, actually has distances between trees. And what this means is that this map, F, can have at most one fixed point. And, and that's just because any two fixed points would then have to be half their own distance apart. <laughs> so then they would have to be the same behavior. Uh, okay. So in other words, in Z, this equation has at most one solution. And as we already know, it's, uh, it's this one. Okay. So applying the same logic more generally, we uh, take a look at you know n-dimensional systems of the same form, and there's okay there's some conditions on the on the booleans here, but I won't get into that. Uh, any system of the same form with productive coefficients, thinking of the right hand side now as a map on z to the n, uh, must also have distances in the product metric. Okay, so the UA says precisely that any productive left affine system of this form, you know, with you know productive coefficients must have at most one solution. So this is taking a principle from uh, Z and applying it to the expressions up to equivalence. Okay, but the utility of the uniqueness axiom, at least for, you know, with the completeness proof in mind, actually becomes much clearer once we realize that it applies to automata as well. So automata correspond to productive left, left affine systems in an intuitive way, uh, and in fact, the left affine systems could really be seen in as, another, as another notation for them. So this is best seen by example. Uh, on the left, I have an automaton with three states and a productive left affine system on the right containing exactly the same information. After a little work, a solution can be found. It's this one. What the UA tells us is that up to provable equivalence, this is the only solution to that previous system. Okay, interestingly, um, and what makes the completeness proof so tricky is that there is actually no full cleaning theorem for nested behaviors. So while the UA guarantees us that uh, systems have at most one solution, it does not guarantee the existence of a solution. Uh, and this, this, this is what I mean by not having a full Cleaney theorem. So there are uh, automata that do not admit any solutions at all. So this is an example from 2008, sort of the paper that got a lot of this started. Um, but we actually found a whole wealth of examples, including this very simple two-state example. Okay, so now the completeness proof isn't too bad, um, although it does use a little bit of coalgebra. So a theorem of Yan Rutens says that behavioral equivalence and by similarity coincide. So um, if we are actually given two behavioral, uh, behaviorally equivalent expressions, there is actually some, we know that there is some bisimulation that relates them. Uh, the bisimulation itself is an automaton, uh, and so the, and, and, uh, and so we can you know relate. Uh, you know, E and F by some, with some automaton and uh, two homomorphisms. Uh, we also know that the inclusion homomorphisms from the automata imp implementing E and F are solutions and uh, that we can pull solutions back as well. So we get two solutions to R by the UA. So, you know, there's at most one solution. So E and F have to be equivalent. And this is sort of the proof of the completeness theorem. Okay. But our paper actually ends uh, not with a completeness theorem for behavioral equivalence, um, but with a, actually with a method uh, for turning the completeness theorem for behavioral uh, equivalence into the completeness theorem from the 2019 paper, which I think is kind of neat. So the idea is to define a new semantics, which unfurls the expression and then prunes all of the dead branches off. So um, in the example before, there were no live branches. Uh, so uh, this is the example I've written down here. Uh, there are no live branches of p.0 um, or actually p to the a for that matter, and there are no live branches of zero, obviously, because there are no, you know, successful uh, terminations in either uh, in either tree. Uh, and so when you prune all the dead branches, you just get zero uh, from for both of them. Okay, so that's two completeness theorems. There's quite a lot to say about future work, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, basically, we're hoping to reduce the UA down to the single variable case, as in Saloma's axiomatization of Cleaning algebra. The problem here, honestly, is just the lack of a left distribution rule, uh, which makes systems of equations very difficult to simplify. Uh, uh, more other questions are, are about the trees themselves. So we have some idea of how to tell when a behavior is nested, um, but we don't 
quite know if we have a full characterization. Uh, in particular, we want to know if nestedness is actually decidable for trees. That would be really interesting, or at least for rational trees. Uh, so uh, another question uh, is about uh, you know other uh, axiomatizations of GCAT. So Kleene algebra and Kleene algebra with tests both admit a, a, a really nice order axiomatization. Uh, we want to know if GCAT actually also has one of these order axiomatizations. GCAT actually uh, inherits an order from CAT, in a sense, um, which could be worth looking into. A more high-level question is about the methodology of the completeness proof. Uh, essentially, we think there is something to be said about the universal quadratic machinery operating in the background, um, but we don't know its role quite yet, and uh, it would be nice to see this clarified in the literature. Okay, so an extended version of our paper can be found in the archive right now. Here's the link, but don't click on it here or else you'll pause the video and that would be very embarrassing. Okay, thank you for listening.